is only just beginning. There's so much to experience and see. Explore Azerbaijan, a road into the future.
Azerbaijan. This is the road we choose. It's the road we follow. This is the road to the future. We look forward and discover new horizons. Aim for the top and see new heights. We construct. We build. We create infrastructure. We put to sea and set sail for new shores. We push ahead. Speed up. And take off. We celebrate the sunrise. Bask in the sun. We make the world around us a better place to live by introducing new technology and implementing greener energy. We dream big and see our dreams come true. We explore our natural resources with care. We fashion new opportunities to make our lives more exciting. Our past is forever in our hearts. Every house has a story to tell, and every stone a legend to share. We find joy in every new dawn. We find inspiration in the hues and shapes of nature. We rediscover the world around us and happily welcome everyone to Azerbaijan. We remember our poets and wise men's names by heart. We hold their legacies dear. Our journey is only just beginning. There's so much to experience and see. Explore Azerbaijan, a road into the future.
Azerbaijan. This is the road we choose. It's the road we follow. This is the road to the future. We look forward and discover new horizons. Aim for the top and see new heights. We construct. We build. We create infrastructure. We put to sea and set sail for new shores. We push ahead. Speed up. And take off. We celebrate the sunrise. Bask in the sun. We make the world around us a better place to live by introducing new technology and implementing greener energy. We dream big and see our dreams come true. We explore our natural resources with care. We fashion new opportunities to make our lives more exciting. Our past is forever in our hearts. Every house has a story to tell, and every stone a legend to share. We find joy in every new dawn. We find inspiration in the hues and shapes of nature. We rediscover the world around us and happily welcome everyone to Azerbaijan. We remember our poets and wise men's names by heart. We hold their legacies dear. Our journey is only just beginning. There's so much to experience and see. Explore Azerbaijan, a road into the future.
Azerbaijan. This is the road we choose. It's the road we follow. This is the road to the future. We look forward and discover new horizons. Aim for the top and see new heights. We construct. We build. We create infrastructure. We put to sea and set sail for new shores. We push ahead. Speed up. And take off. We celebrate the sunrise. Bask in the sun. We make the world around us a better place to live by introducing new technology and implementing greener energy. We dream big and see our dreams come true. We explore our natural resources with care. We fashion new opportunities to make our lives more exciting. Our past is forever in our hearts. Every house has a story to tell, and every stone a legend to share. We find joy in every new dawn. We find inspiration in the hues and shapes of nature. We rediscover the world around us and happily welcome everyone to Azerbaijan. We remember our poets and wise men's names by heart. We hold their legacies dear. Our journey is only just beginning. There's so much to experience and see. Explore Azerbaijan, a road into the future.
Azerbaijan. This is the road we choose. It's the road we follow. This is the road to the future. We look forward and discover new horizons. Aim for the top and see new heights. We construct. We build. We create infrastructure. We put to sea and set sail for new shores. We push ahead. Speed up. And take off. We celebrate the sunrise. Bask in the sun. We make the world around us a better place to live by introducing new technology and implementing greener energy. We dream big and see our dreams come true. We explore our natural resources with care. We fashion new opportunities to make our lives more exciting. Our past is forever in our hearts. Every house has a story to tell, and every stone a legend to share. We find joy in every new dawn. We find inspiration in the hues and shapes of nature. We rediscover the world around us and happily welcome everyone to Azerbaijan. We remember our poets and wise men's names by heart. We hold their legacies dear. Our journey is only just beginning. There's so much to experience and see. Explore Azerbaijan, a road into the future.
Azerbaijan. This is the road we choose. It's the road we follow. This is the road to the future. We look forward and discover new horizons. Aim for the top and see new heights. We construct. We build. We create infrastructure. We put to sea and set sail for new shores. We push ahead. Speed up. And take off. We celebrate the sunrise. Bask in the sun. We make the world around us a better place to live by introducing new technology and implementing greener energy. We dream big and see our dreams come true. We explore our natural resources with care. We fashion new opportunities to make our lives more exciting. Our past is forever in our hearts. Every house has a story to tell, and every stone a legend to share. We find joy in every new dawn. We find inspiration in the hues and shapes of nature. We rediscover the world around us and happily welcome everyone to Azerbaijan. We remember our poets and wise men's names by heart. We hold their legacies dear. Our journey is only just beginning. There's so much to experience and see. Explore Azerbaijan, a road into the future.
Oke. Okay. Organized by the Department of International Affairs at UITM Global. I would like to take this opportunity to wish everyone uh, a happy new year. I know it's not too late yet. And uh, of course, um, an excellent 2022 to all of our audience and our distinguished guests this morning. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're indeed honored to have His Excellency Irfan Davudov, Ambassador Extraordinaire, uh, Extraordinaire and Planning Potentiary Embassy of the Republic of Azerbaijan in Malaysia for the eighth ambassadorial lecture. So thank you, uh, His Excellency, for taking time off your busy schedule. And I'm sure all our audience is really looking forward to this very timely topic uh, to know more about um, Azerbaijan uh, as from your title 90s to today independence and development path of Azerbaijan. So to all of our um, audience out there, uh, very shortly, um, we will also like you to perhaps uh, start uh, putting in your questions in our pigeon hole that we have in the chat. And as usual, at the very end of the lecture, uh, we will have a Q&A session. And then by about uh, the time that we have scheduled, we should be able to end our program um, accordingly. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, uh, I would now like to invite uh, Yang Berbahagia, Professor uh, Dr. Muhammad Sazili Sahibi, our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, exercising the functions of the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and International, to deliver his welcoming remarks. So, Prof. Sazili, the screen is all yours. We need to take the audio, Prof. Sorry. Okay, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, the Honorable His Excellency Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary Irfan Davudov, Ambassador of the Republic of Azerbaijan to Malaysia, Yang Berusaha Dr. Zainab Haji Matno, Director Department of International Affairs to ITM Globals, Distinguished guests, my Kwarga UITM, ladies and gentlemen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Selamat pagi and good mornings. I'm honored to be here today for the 8th Ambassadorial Lecture Series and to welcome our distinguished guests, His Excellency Irfan Davudov, Ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary of the republics of Azerbaijan to Malaysia who will speak on from 90s to today independence and development parts of Azerbaijan. Today, January 20, is significant in the memory of Azerbaijanis as a symbol of unshakable well, in the names of national independence and freedom of the Azerbaijanis peoples. The tragedy of January 20, 1990, will also call back January, was an important turning point to Azerbaijan, which proved that the nation's struggles for liberty and independence was irreversible, resulting in the collapse of Soviet Union. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your willingness to share the historic moment of your country and relate as a Bajanis experiences with us firsthand. It is indeed heartwarming to see many online to listen to Your Excellency's talks. We continue to seek new opportunities in the new year to connect with the rest of our communities and others part of the world. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency's impressive data includes appointment 
as the ambassador of Azerbaijan to Malaysia as well, as the non-resident ambassador designate of the Republic of Azerbaijan to Brunei Darussalam on July 23rd, 2021. His Excellency is trilingual, the native speaker of Azerbaijanis, an excellent speaker in Russian and fluent in English. This was an advantage when he was studying international economics relations at Azerbaijan universities. And when holding posts around the globe, I hope students would take special note in his ability to speak many languages. His Excellency started his foreign assignments as a second secretary from 2002-2005, which led to his appointment as the first secretary to Romania from 2005-2006. He was also appointed as a councillor from September 2013-2017 at the Embassy of the Azerbaijan in Romania. Prior to this, he served at the Embassy of Azerbaijan in Ukraine as a councillor from March 2008 to May 2012. His other experiences include serving as the head of division, Youth Development Issues Division, from December 2019 to July 23, 2021, and Chief Advisor from September 2018 and December 2019 at the Department of Youth Policy and Sport Issues, Administration of the President of the Republic, Azerbaijan. His agency's past experiences on both bilateral and multilateral issues at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Azerbaijan prepare him very well to be a diplomat. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me share a brief history of Azerbaijan and Malaysia's bilateral relationships. On the 31st of December 1991, Malaysia was one of the first friendly nations that recognized Azerbaijan's independence from the Soviet Union. And on the 5th April 1993, full diplomatic relations were established between Malaysia and Azerbaijan with the aim of strengthening their political, economic, and social cultural links. In July 2007, the Embassy of the Republic of Azerbaijan was established in Malaysia, and the Embassy of Malaysia was then established in Azerbaijan in April 2014. Since then, various bilateral relations, high-level visits, and meeting by head governments, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Chairman of Parliament, Humanitarian Corporation, economic cooperation, as well as treaty and legal basis have been signed between our two countries. This operation are based on the principles of mutual benefit and understanding. The world is changing rapidly day by day. Mutual relationship and cooperation is very important for every country. Today, this also it is almost impossible for any country to develop by itself. To gain progress, every country needs help and cooperation from others. Although Malaysia and Azerbaijan experience different scale of struggle toward independence, nonetheless, the struggle was real, hard and painful. Upon independence, both countries needed to determine its cost to diversify the economic sources of growth in order to survive. The restructuring was guided by the strategic roadmaps on the national economic perspective and main sector of the economies of the country. The roadmaps envisioned an economy that is more integrated regionally and globally. I'm sure Malaysia and Azerbaijan are able to help one another in developing stronger ties in economic, social, and education realms. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, 
in recognizing the importance of strengthening bilateral relations between Malaysia and Azerbaijan, UITM have established strong ties with the Embassy of Azerbaijan in Malaysia. Various activities and visit path the way for closer cooperation between the embassies and UITM in academic and area of the mutual interest. For information, Department of International Affairs first relation with the embassy was in organizing the fourth international partners lecture series on the July 2021. On this occasion, as a Bajanese esteemed speakers, Dr. Farid Safiyev, Chairman of the Center of Analysis of International Relations, deliver an insightful talk on new geopolitics of the South Caucasus and Azerbaijan's role in shaping trans-regional cooperation. Another UITM Embassy of Azerbaijan initiative was held on November 17, 2021. This collaboration meeting called by Ministry of Education in Azerbaijan helped UITM to conduct to connect with Azerbaijan Medical University, Azerbaijan Technical University, Baku Engineering University, and Baku State University. I was informed that the, the networking is well underway with prospective faculties and will con and will culminate in signing of Memoranda of Understanding in 2022. This international relation is another illustration of the UITM's journey to become a global renowned university by 2025. All this could only be accomplished with good international relationship and cooperation between UITM and embassies. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope this event could provide opportunities for UITM to network with more universities in Azerbaijan. This lecture is relevant, timely and impactful and can further influence UITM's embassy collaborative efforts. With that, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I know that everyone in the audience are looking forward to the lecture on from 19th to today, Independence and Development Part of Azerbaijan. By our esteemed speakers, His Excellencies, Mr. Irfan Davidov, Ambassador Extraordinary and Planning Potentiary of the Republic of Azerbaijan to Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Sazli, for delivering the welcoming remarks. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please join me now in welcoming His Excellency Irfan Dawudov, Ambassador of Extraordinary and Planning Potentiary of the Republic of Azerbaijan to Malaysia to deliver his lecture on the topic of from 90s to today, independence and development path of Azerbaijan. Excellency, the screen is all yours. Sorry, Excellency, we need to have the audio Unmute, yeah. please. Good. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Salamat pagi. Good morning, Honorable Professor Dr. Mot Sazili Shahibi, Honorable Dr. Hajah Zainab Ajmot Noor. Good morning, distinguished participants. It's a great pleasure and privilege for me to, a to be able to take part in this meeting today. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar, the respected staff of the Mara University. This was the first university I visited in Malaysia as an ambassador, and it made a big impression on me, actually. 
As a result of our discussions with Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Dr. Hajar Oza, we, together with the Ministry of Education of Azerbaijan, organized an online meeting between Mara University and the leading universities in Azerbaijan and had very fruitful discussions, as the Honorable Professor mentioned earlier. I believe that this was a very important start for the development of relations between our countries in the field of education. Cooperation in the field of education can become a very important part of bilateral relations between our friendly peoples. Now we are trying to do everything possible to bring cooperation in all areas to a level that will correspond to the level of our political relations. In the political sphere, our countries are very good and valuable partners for each other in the international arena. We enjoyed consistent mutual support for the initiatives of both countries within the framework of international organizations. Malaysia's support meant a lot to us, especially in the earlier 1990s as a newly independent state, and we had that support. We are grateful to Malaysia for this. Dear participants, as Honorable Professor mentioned already, today, January 20, marks a very important day in the modern history of Azerbaijan. This day divided the history of Azerbaijan into two parts, before January 20 and after it. On this day, 32 years ago, the Soviet army, on the orders of the then leader of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, invaded Baku. This intervention was accompanied by cruelty, murders, huge distractions. Hundreds of citizens were killed, wounded, a huge number of atrocities and humiliations were committed. What caused this intervention? Was it necessary? Was it in accordance with the Constitution and the law? The answer to all these questions can be no. But then, why did it happen? Here I would like to invite you to watch a short video about these events and by your permission, then we will continue.
были введены крупные контингенты советской армии и войск МВД СССР. К чему это привело? Каким трагическим последствиям это привело, теперь уже хорошо нам известно. Can I continue? Yes, Excellency, okay. you may do so. You watched the video, and I think that a little expression you have now. To understand why all this happened, we must make at least a very short excursion on history of Azerbaijan. As you know, the region in which Azerbaijan is located has been a crossroads of civilizations, cultures, and different religions for centuries. This place was once a meeting place for huge empires, a field of bloody battles that decided the fate of entire peoples and states. In order to continue its existence, the Azerbaijani people had to fight, struggle against various enemies coming from the east and west, from the south and north. During this period, many dynasties of rulers, various states went down in history and new ones arose in their place. From time to time, for geopolitical reasons, Azerbaijani territory had to be a part of various empires such as Sassanids, the Khazar Khaganate, or the Caliphate. But after each such period, the Azerbaijani dynasties restored their independence and created their own states. And in the 18th century, a new power appeared from the north the Russian Empire became more and more interested in these territories and increased its influence on the territory of the Caucasus and the Caspian Basin. As a result of this interest, the territory of the South Caucasus became a new Caucasian province of Russia. It should be noted that here that before the Russian occupation, 
The territory of nowadays Republic of Azerbaijan consisted of independent and semi-independent Khanates inhabited by Muslim Azerbaijanis and ruled by Azerbaijani dynasties. One of the most important results of this occupation was the appearance of Armenian settlers from Iran and Ottoman Empire in these lands. Hundreds of thousands of Armenians appreciated by the Russian administration arrived here and created settlements in the territories of Azerbaijani Khanates. Thus, the basis of the future interethnic conflict was created. At the same time, the main goal of the imperial administration was to divide the Islamic Turkic world by provinces where the Armenians would be in majority. If you look at the map of the region, you can easily see the consequences of such a policy. At the same time, I cannot fail to note some positive consequences of Russian influence. Not very quickly, but step by step, mostly reluctantly, a new system of education was created here. The Azerbaijani youth had a very small, but still a chance to get a European education in general schools and Russian universities. During this period, Azerbaijan became a pioneer of the Muslim world in many areas, the first European style works of art, theaters, schools, the first opera, the, new, the first newspaper for Muslims in Russia, etc. Azerbaijan began its slow integration into the social, economic, and educational system of Russia. But this process was interrupted by the Socialist Revolution of 1917, when a new socialist state headed by Vladimir Lenin was established on the ruins of the Russian Empire. Following this revolution, on May, on May 28, 1918, the Azerbaijani founding fathers, considering the current international situation, the requirements and aspirations of the Azerbaijani Muslim population of the region, the need to protect Azerbaijanis from extermination by the Bolsheviks and Dashnak Armenians, announced the creation of a new independent state, the Azerbaijan Democratic Republic in the eastern, central, and southeastern part of Transcaucasia. Due to the fact that Baku, capital of Azerbaijan, was under the occupation of the Bolshevik Tashnaks and after July 1918 of the British Armed Forces, the first government of the new republic was headquartered in Ganja the second largest city in Azerbaijan. During June-September 1918, the young state had to fight powerful enemies for the liberation of its territories, including its capital, the city of Baku. Finally, on September 15, the Islamic Caucasian army, under the command of prominent Ottoman commander Nuru Pasha, liberated Baku and the Azerbaijani government moved here. Unfortunately, the life of the first republic in the, in the entire Muslim world lasted only two years. But in this very short period, the Azerbaijani Democrats managed to achieve very noticeable results. Democratic parliamentary elections, democratically appointed governments, voting rights for everyone, including women, parliamentary representation for national minorities, and so on. By the way, in the issue of women's voting rights, Azerbaijan was ahead of many countries, even European countries. A huge number of young people that time were sent to European universities. Baku State University was established, the only one in the Muslim territories of entire former Soviet uh, Russian Empire at that time. Unfortunately, I am not able to list all the achievements of that time, but believe me, they were very impressive. At the end of April 1920, the Soviet army invaded and occupied Azerbaijan, and the new, this time, so-called Soviet Socialist Republic was established. The new power immediately began repressions against Azerbaijani people. From 1920 till 1950s, under the name of nationalist, musavatist, pan-Turkist, left-sider, right-sider, and many, many others, a lot of Azerbaijanis, mainly the representatives of well-known families, 
prominent politicians, public figures, statesmen, writers, poets, military officers, and others were killed, exiled, imprisoned. This wave of Soviet repression costed the lives of about 100,000 of Azerbaijanis during these 30 years. Alongside with these repressions, repression against the territory of Azerbaijan took place as well. By the decision of Communist Party leadership, huge territories of the Republic were given to neighboring Republic, Armenia at the first years of the Soviet power. And this process had its continuation till the end of 1960s. The new entity, Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Province was created for 20,000 Armenians living there in the mountainous territories of Karabakh province. While no autonomy was created for millions of Azerbaijanis living in Armenia at the same time. Such a policy, of course, caused dissatisfaction among the people of Azerbaijan, but the Soviet machine of repression had extensive experience and a serious approach in the fight against dissent. This policy resulted in the reduction of the territories of Azerbaijan Soviet Socialist Republic to 60 uh, to 86,000 square kilometers in 1988. It was about 120,000 square kilometers at the time of Azerbaijan Democratic Republic. In addition, in different years, under various pretexts, the Azerbaijani population living in Armenia was forced to leave, subjected to repression and deported to Central Asia and Kazakhstan. As a result, in the first years of Soviet rule, the number of Azerbaijanis who made up almost half of the population of the Armenian SSR was about 200,000 in 1980s. In 1988, during Gorbachev's perestroika policy in the Soviet Union, Armenian nationalists decided it was time to achieve another goal the expulsion of all Azerbaijanis from Armenia and the annexation of Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia. All means have been used for this. Between 1987 and 1988, all Azerbaijanis living in Armenia were forced to leave their native lands, property, homes, and to live for Azerbaijan. This work was carried out as planned by Armenian diaspora and supported by the Moscow authorities. First of all, the Armenian diaspora succeeded in removing Heydar Aliyev, a prominent son of the Azerbaijani people who held a high position in Moscow until 1987 from the post of the first deputy chairman of the Soviet Council of Ministers. Immediately after that, the process of expelling Azerbaijanis from Armenia began. As for Azerbaijan, these people, according to Moscow's instructions, were placed not in the regions inhabited by Armenians, but in large cities such as Baku and Sungai. We did not that time that this was a preparation for future provocations. Armenia's Karabakh claims were an expected event for Azerbaijan. At the beginning, the people hoped that the central Moscow government would respond adequately to these provocations and normalize the situation. But over time, we had seen that the central Soviet government, on the contrary, was taking measures to separate Karabakh from Azerbaijan. Also, this was completely contrary to the institutions of both the Soviet Union and Azerbaijan. The territory of any republic could not be changed without its consent. Such a position of the government forced the people to struggle for their lands. Peaceful demonstrations and strikes began in Baku and other cities. The people demanded that the government abide by the constitution and punish the separatism. Soviet security forces began to organize various provocations to tarnish the people's movement and turn it into a wrong path. In large cities, 
there were clashes, deaths, atrocities on national ground. Later on, it turned out that all these events were organized and carried out by the Soviet Special Services. But at that time, we, of course, were not aware about this. After all these preparations, on the night January from 19 to 20, 1990, the Soviet army entered Baku. Interestingly, they knew that the army would enter Baku and the situation of emergency was imposed in Baku was announced after the incident on the morning of January 20. The population of Baku were now aware that there was an emergency situation in Baku that time. As a result of this military intervention, 147 civilians were killed and more than 700 were seriously injured. This event went down in the history of modern Azerbaijan as Black January. The Soviet army deployed to the country in order to prevent the national movement and break the will of the Azerbaijani people for independence, committed massacre against the peaceful population, violating the norms of international law, the constitutions of the former USSR and the Azerbaijan SSR. At the press conference at the permanent representation of Azerbaijan in Moscow, immediately after the tragic events, national leader Haidar Aliyev strongly condemned these atrocities and demanded political assessment of the massacre against our people and punishment for the perpetrators. Despite the danger of this, of his life and the life of his family, Haidar Aliyev proved once again that he was a true son of the Azerbaijani people, and at the same time, this was a great support to other people who were completely alone that time. At the same time, this intervention was aimed at intimidating the national liberation movements in the Soviet Union as a whole. Thus, at that time, the people's movement in the Baltic republics of the Soviet Union, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, and other republics began to show slogans of independence. The Soviet leadership wanted to send a message to all these movements on the example of Azerbaijan that the Soviet army could destroy them all. The reason for choosing Azerbaijan was that the Soviet leadership knew that if such bloody events took place in other republics, Western countries would react harshly. 32 years passed since the tragedy, but this gross violation of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and other international legal documents, and which was one of the serious crimes of the 20th century by its essence and scope, had not received an international political and legal assessment. The former Soviet leadership is directly responsible for the, this crime. According to international law, the events of January 20 must be described as a crime against humanity and its initiators and perpetrators must be brought to justice. At a special session of the Milli Majlis Parliament in February 1994, the brutal murder of innocent people on January 20, 1990, was regarded as military aggression and crime. And as a result of the deliberations in March 1994, decision on the tragic events committed in Baku on January 20, 1990, was adopted. Since then, 20 January has been commemorated as National <coughs> Morning Day in Azerbaijan. Why is, it, why is the date of January 20 so important for the people of Azerbaijan? Why do we not forget these events, despite the fact that 32 years have passed? The main reason is that this event showed that the Azerbaijani people could no longer be in the Soviet regime and had begun its independent, uh, regain its independence. The People's Movement became a national liberation movement. This movement eventually led to the collapse of the Soviet Union 
and the restoration of Azerbaijan's independence. But gaining independence did not solve the problems. The Soviet central government and the world Armenian diaspora did everything they could to divide Azerbaijan and deprive it of its territories. Armenians were rapidly armed and fully supported by the Soviet army, and information war was organized against Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, a victim of aggression, was portrayed as an aggressor, and many Western countries supported Armenia under the influence of Armenian lobby without getting to the heart of the matter. All this has led to very serious consequences for Azerbaijan and for the whole region as well. In the first years of independence, the country faced major social, political and economic problems, as well as direct armed intervention by Armenian armed force. In 1991, 1994, the Armenian armed forces in, and Armenian terrorist forces uh, forced Azerbaijanis leaving Karabakh, in Karabakh and surrounding areas to leave their native lands. This process was accompanied by murders, robberies, terror and destruction. More than 20,000 of Azerbaijanis were killed. Almost 20% of the territory of Azerbaijan was occupied. About 700,000 Azerbaijanis living in 12 districts became internally displayed persons, and the Republic faced a humanitarian crisis. Internal political conflicts, social economic problems, failures on the front, military uprisings, put the country in danger of destruction. It was at this, at this time, in June 1993, that the national leader of the Azerbaijani people, Heydar Aliyev, returned to the leadership of Azerbaijan. This happened at the demand of the people, because our people understood that Heydar Aliyev was the only person who could save us from this tragic situation. Heydar Aliyev began his activity by achieving social and political stability in the country. Effective measures were taken to build the army and qualified personnel were involved in the army. A ceasefire was reached with Armenia in May 1994 because in the absence of regular army, continuation of the war could result in the loss of new territories. We can talk for a long time about the measures taken during the presidency of Haidar Aliyev. In order not to waste your time, I will mention only the most important issues that were of great importance for the future development of our country. Serious reforms have been carried out in social, economic and political life. The country has moved to a socially oriented market economy. The establishment of a democratic legal society based on multi-party uh, political system was begun. After 70 years of totalitarian Soviet rule, this work required great wisdom, patience and planning. Expanding relations with the European Union, the United States and Islamic countries breaking the information blockade and conveying Azerbaijan's just position to the world community required great efforts. During the 10 years of presidency of Haidar Aliyev, this work was carried out step by step permanently. Azerbaijan's political, economic and trade relations have been expanded and effective measures have been taken to attract foreign investments. In September 1994, the contract of the century was signed in Baku with the participation of 13 major oil companies from eight countries. This was the beginning of the implementation of a new oil strategy developed by Haidar Aliyev. The first oil produced under this contract was sold in December 1999 and thus, Azerbaijan began to receive revenues from oil exports. The increase in oil production 
forced Azerbaijan to find new export routes. The renewed Baku Navarasisk and Baku Batumi oil pipelines could not meet export needs. Therefore, by the, by the decision of Heydar Aliyev, work began on new oil pipeline projects Baku Tbilisi Sutsa and Baku Tbilisi Jeha. The first pipeline was commissioned in 1999 and the second one in 2006. The increase in revenues from oil export allowed Azerbaijan to ensure stable social economic growth. Major infrastructure projects had been launched across the country. Entrepreneurship development, revival of agriculture, creation of new industries, increase of export opportunities have become priority issues. Baku became the economic center not only of Azerbaijan, but of the entire region. Azerbaijan has become an initiator and active participant of all economic energy transport projects and programs implemented in the region. The Traseka program, envisaging restoration of historic Silkway, the North-South Transport Corridor project, which connects Russia and Northern European countries with Iran, Pakistan, and India, the Baku Tbilisi Erzurum Natural Gas Pipeline Project, the Tanap Tap Gas Pipeline Project, which carries Azerbaijan natural gas to European countries, have become symbols of a new era. As I mentioned above, all these works were carried out on the basis of the development strategy defined by Heydar Aliyev and is still ongoing. In accordance with this strategy, a special oil fund has been established in Azerbaijan, and all revenues from oil exports are being collected in this fund. Following the goal of transforming of capital, uh, oil capital into human capital, the Azerbaijani government pays special attention to spending oil revenues on the development of the younger generation, their transformation into competitive professionals. For this purpose, in 2007-2015, thousands of young Azerbaijanis were sent to the world's leading universities at public expense. This program will be restored this year by the order of President Ilham Aliyev, and I hope that Malaysian universities, including Mara University, will be in the list for Azerbaijani students to come and get an education. At the same time, the development of the country's regions, the development of the known oil sectors of economy, the development of an export-oriented economy, were and still are in the spotlight. Industrial parks make a special contribution to the development of economy. As a result of measures taken by the state in recent years, the production of non-oil goods, including agricultural products, is growing rapidly. And Azerbaijan exporters operating in this field are already ready to enter the markets of Malaysia and other countries in the region. I have several proposals from Azerbaijani businessmen in this regard, and I hope that they will succeed in this. In terms of foreign trade, Azerbaijan's main trading partners are European countries, as well as Russia, Turkey, Turkey, Iran, and Georgia. For many years, the main export products were oil and oil products. But in recent years, the share of non-oil products in export is growing rapidly. As a result of all these measures, today the Republic of Azerbaijan has become one of the most developed countries in the Soviet post-Soviet space. Almost 80% of the gross domestic product of the South Caucasus is produced in Azerbaijan. International rating agencies and economic forums rank the country high on various indicators. Significant progress has been made in achieving the sustainable development goals improving the welfare of the population and addressing social problems such as poverty and unemployment. With its develop, developed transport and transit infrastructure, Azerbaijan has become a transport hub in the region 
and the reliable transit country between Europe and Central Asian countries. The Baku International Trade Seaport, which was commissioned in recent years, will be able to process 25 million tons of cargo and 1 million containers annually when fully operational. There are reliable ferry services between the port of Baku and the ports of Turkmenbash in Turkmenistan, Atrao, in, Atrao and Aktau in Kazakhstan, with ports of Iran and Russia. The Baku-Tbilisi Cars Railway, which was launched in 2017, transport, transports goods from Europe to Asian countries. However, it should be noted that the greatest achievement of Azerbaijan in the history of independence was the liberation of its lands from occupation. Committed to the negotiation process for nearly 30 years, Azerbaijan hoped for a peaceful settlement of the conflict. the withdrawal of Armenian troops from the occupied territories and the peaceful return of internally displaced persons to their native lands. However, ignoring the norms and principles of international law, four United Nations Security Council resolutions and the calls of a number of international organizations, including Islamic Cooperation Organization and non aligned Movement, the Armenian side did not allow a peaceful solution to the conflict. On the contrary, assessing Azerbaijan's desire for peace as a weakness, Armenia tried to strengthen itself in the occupied territories and conduct illegal settlements. The OEC Minsk Group, established in 1992 to re resolve the conflict, has not done anything to resolve the conflict for 30 years but representatives of some member states called on Azerbaijan to reconcile with the fact of occupation and give its lands to Armenia. This created false expectations on the part of Armenia and convinced it that it would achieve the annexation of Azerbaijani lands. Also, the conflict was called frozen in political terminology. It should be noted that every year Many, many Azerbaijani citizens, both servicemen and civilians, became victims of ceasefire violations by the Armenian army. The passage of the front line near the settlements of Azerbaijan caused the population of these settlements to be in constant danger. Agricultural lands in the front line remained unused. The Armenian army occupying the sources of the rivers, prevented the people living along the rivers from benefiting from these water resources. In early April 2016, there were very serious armed clashes on the front line. In response to the provocations, about 2,000 hectares of territory were liberated by the Azerbaijani army. But taking into account the request of international mediators, the Azerbaijani side suspended military operations and gave Armenia another chance to resolve the conflict peacefully. However, the statement of the new leader of Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan, at the meeting in Karabakh, that Karabakh is Armenia and full point, clearly showed that the Armenian side was not going to liberate Azerbaijani lands. On the contrary, the Armenian government the new government declared the doctrine of a new war for new lands, for new territories, and was constantly provoking in the front line, trying to reoccupy the territories liberated in 2016. One such provocation took place in July 2020, killing 12 Azerbaijani servicemen, including several high-ranked officers and a general. Finally, in response to another serious provocation by the Armenian army, on September 27, 2020, the Azerbaijani army, led by the President, Supreme Commander-in-Chief Ilham Aliyev, began counterattack operation and in 
44 days liberated almost all occupied lands. During the war, our people demonstrated a very strong national unity, supported our army and president with all their might. And this was the guarantee for our victory. At the request of the defeated Armenian side, the president of Azerbaijan agreed to cease military operations on November 10, 2020, and signed a trilateral statement to prevent further bloodshed, together with uh, Prime Minister of Armenia and President of Russia. Immediately after that, demanding and extensive construction work began on the liberated lands. For 30 years, the Armenians have completely destroyed these lands, destroyed hundreds of settlements, roads and bridges. Let me give just one example. 65 of the 69 mosques in the region were destroyed entirely, and the rest became stables for cattle and pigs. In doing so, the Armenia wanted to insult the national and religious feelings of the Azerbaijani people. President of Azerbaijan, Stilham Aliyev, has declared these lands to be a green economy and green energy zone. The first international airport has been op opened in the liberated city of Pizuli. Construction of roads, railways, and power stations continues apace. As President Ilham Aliyev said, we prove to the whole world that unlike the Armenians, the Azerbaijani people are a constructive, creative people. We will soon restore all our liberated lands and ensure they are re blooming. Azerbaijan has been has both material and moral opportunities for this. The road to all these results began on January 20, 1990, as I said. That is why this history is very significant for the people of Azerbaijan, and we will remember the martyrs of our people on that day throughout the history. Here, I want to conclude my uh, so-called lecture, because I am not sure entirely that it was a lecture, but I hope that you got some new information on Azerbaijan, and uh, I, together with my councillor, Mr. Rafik, will be ready to answer your questions, if any. Thank you very much for your attention, and let's continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency um, Irfan, for the very insightful sharing of uh, to this topic. Um, Excellency has taken us to the history of Azerbaijan and uh, why today's date, uh, January 20th, um, is a very significant uh, date. And uh, based on that date, um, His Excellency has taken us from there onwards and through the journey into what Azerbaijan is today, all right, from gaining independence uh, to um, leveraging on the economy uh, and uh, working on several elements such as SDGs, um, including the youth involvement uh, and so forth. So I think, um, Excellency, it's been a very great sharing. Uh, of course, uh, like you said, um, uh, you know, it may not be a lecture, but uh, I think um, the information that has just been shared uh today uh has been uh, very beneficial i'm sure to all our audience we have in our audience our students our faculty members and also uh our partners from uh different parts of the world uh listening so as always in our ambassador lecture we have uh provided them a uh tool called pigeon hole where they post their questions so i think i will let our secretariat um very much uh, share with us the, the questions that have been posed in the pigeon pool, and we can all see it on the screen. Maybe uh, Dr. Linda?
Okay, um, I hope uh, Excellency and also Mr. Rafi can can, can um, see the screen, right? The the questions, yes. Okay, um, very first one. It says I watched the video in the beginning showing how developed your country is. So how did your government manage to develop and build a nation as it is today? So uh, can you share your thoughts on that? Uh, Excellency, please. Okay. I think you, all right. Uh, I'll try to answer to this question. I think that I mentioned some issues on this uh, in my lecture, but uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of our independence, it was very difficult time for Azerbaijan and our nation was divi uh, divided by political, social, uh, separatist means. But uh, as I said, our national leader, Heydar Aliyev, when he came into power in 1994, uh, 93, decided that the main issue must be a political and social stability in the country. After that, he declared a, a policy of Azerbaijanism, which means that every Azerbaijani citizen, not dependent on his religious nationality and so on, must be a true citizen of Azerbaijan, must benefit from achievements in Azerbaijan, and must serve the Azerbaijani state. Uh, such a policy, of course, uh, uh, allowed us to unify our people and uh, to create new conditions for the social and economic development, to, to establish, to create new army, which, uh, as a result, liberated our territories. Uh, I, 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 I don't know if I succeed to answer to this question, but I think that this is enough, at least to understand how we managed. Right. Great. Thank you, uh, Excellency, because I think they were impressed with the video that we showed um, during registration. All right. And uh, so moving right along, so here's another one. Thank you, His Excellency, for showing us what independence means. Just wondering if youth volunteer, uh, volunteers are required in your country. If so, how do I participate to help the people of Azerbaijan? So this is a question maybe from one of our students who are very interested in volunteerism. Uh, so, Your Excellency, your response to this question? Uh, for last three years in Azerbaijan, uh, from uh, 2018 to till the July 2021, I was at the presidential administration. I was a head of youth policy division, and I have I had some how to say relation to this issue. The uh, such a movement is widely uh, how to say spread in Azerbaijan. We have a lot of Azerbaijani young people to be involved in this uh, volunteers movements and uh, my uh, I am open to discuss with you this question and I can help you to contact to your to persons in Azerbaijan who is dealing with this issue and you can create relations with them and to of course in future to participate in some projects, programs implemented in Azerbaijan. Please contact us and I'll do my best to help you in this issue. Thank you, Excellency. And I'm sure because uh, even the university, UITM itself, uh, a very strong um, group of volunteers, student volunteers. And, uh, and of course, I think that's one of the uh, interests. So I'm glad that they have asked that question and we'll definitely keep in touch with your uh, good office for more information. So, okay, we can move on to the next question. Um, so thank you, Excellency, for showing us the path to a developed nation. I'm moved by the video you showed on the sufferings of your people. So how could we Malaysians help out in the education sector? 
or section? Uh, we are uh, working on this issue, of course, as I said in my speech, we are creating relations between Azerbaijan and uh, Malaysian universities uh, to, to, in order to develop, to create, to expand cooperation in this field. Uh, many Azerbaijani young people got an education in Malaysia uh, recent years and uh, we are going to improve, to, to increase this number. And uh, if I understood correctly, you are asking me how can you help me in this uh, regard? If you have such proposals, such suggestions, to create some relations with Azerbaijani universities, with Azerbaijani young people who is going to get education in Malaysia, please contact us and we, with a great pleasure, we do our best to create such contacts. contacts. Thank you. Hi, great. Thank you. Uh, moving right along, uh, quite a number of questions waiting for us. So. Uh, we shall highlight the next question. Yeah, I was wondering if being the ambassador to Malaysia, able to assist Azerbaijan to develop the nation further, or could Malaysia actually learn from Azerbaijanis? So if so, what would that be? You know, I think that this process must, you know, must be a mutual process. We both have uh, things which can we can experiences achievements uh, which we can use uh, we can uh, use for the cooperation we can share to each other and so on and i think that uh, there is there are many many things uh, from in malaysia from which azerbaijan can benefit and we also have very uh, considerable experience very considerable achievements in uh, some fields where Malaysian side can learn something beneficial for itself. So I think that we have very, very good potential for the development of our bilateral relations and we as an embassy uh, work in this direction to expand our relations with Malaysia to develop our relations in the uh, spheres as education, health, uh, let's say scientific research, uh, culture, uh, and other, other, including economic and trade relations. We invite Malaysian companies to take part in investment uh, projects in Azerbaijan. Uh, right now we have, as I said, huge territory of liberated territories and we, our government is doing its best to rehabilitate these territories and also we invite Malaysian companies to come and to participate in this process. I think that some Malaysian companies have very huge potential for this and as a companies from our friendly country will be very glad to see Malaysian companies to come and invest to, to, to get benefits from these projects. Thank you. So that's the answer to the question. It's also about uh, being mutually, right? Uh, mutual uh, benefits for both. So next question asks, hope UITM and Embassy, for the university, UITM and Embassy, could be the best partner in working together and also learn from each other. So how could we be that kind of partner for both parties to benefit? So this is about UITM and uh, the potential uh, excellency. As I said, uh, UTM was the first university in Malaysia I visited after arriving in Kuala Lumpur. And I'm glad that you are working on uh, establishing of uh, cooperation relations with Azerbaijani universities, and I hope that this process will uh, have its continuation in future. I think that in this field, in the field of education, we have very good, very huge potential, and especially 
uh, university, Mara University, is very interesting for us from this regard as one of the best universities in Malaysia. And everybody who, who, who want to participate in this process, I think without any problems, can be engaged and uh, to have his benefits from this process as well as contribute to the development of such a cooperation. Everybody is welcome in this regard. And as I said, embassy is open for all such proposals, such suggestions from the side of Malaysian universities. And we will discuss and create uh, such relations. Thank you. Excellent. And, I, and I'm sure uh... There are a lot of potentials, the, the future road ahead for higher education uh, Malaysia and also higher education uh, Azerbaijan, yeah? Uh, specifically uh, for UITM, I'm sure the faculties are working very hard to start getting to know each other more and, you know, embarking on several projects already. All right, uh, next question, uh, Excellency. So it's going to be about the younger generation. So how did the younger generation view the independence uh, achieved then? So what are actually their sentiments and their views of, of uh, on on independence? Yeah. You know, this is a very actual, how to say, problem, not for Azerbaijan, but for all countries, I think, because sometimes young people thought that everything was too easy to get independence, to, to develop economically, socially, politically, and so on. And our policy is that our young people must learn history carefully, be aware about the historical events happened in the history of Azerbaijan, be ready to develop, to, to, to increase Azerbaijani uh, economy, Azerbaijani political system, and so on, be ready to, to, to be uh, leaders of the state and to take Azerbaijan further. Uh, this must be the main goal of the young generation. And we, as a elder uh, generation, must transmit our knowledge on our history to the younger generation to prepare for for future struggles, because unfortunately, the world is very cruel, and in order to be a developed country, to keep to 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 protect its independence, every country must be ready to address the challenges, to take necessary measures, and the young uh, generation must be prepared for this goal. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Excellency, I couldn't agree more with you that history plays a very important uh, factor and also the uh, today's generation, uh, you know, in, in guiding and, and preserving uh, traditions uh, and also uh, that spirit of uh, patriotism, you know, uh, and and uh, uh, embracing the hardship of the, yeah, the, uh, the former uh the the elderly the so-called yeah pioneers in, in independence and and that has to remain okay great we are moving on to a few more questions all right i'm glad today our excellency there are a lot of questions uh in our vision world we hope we can address all of them so what are the relationships like with the former soviet regime i know someone would definitely want to ask this question today uh, how does history help develop the path to national development in the current uh, stage? I think you are unmuted, uh, Excellency. Yes. Thank you. Of course. If, if, if you mean uh, our relations uh, with uh, former Soviet uh, republics, if you uh, mean this, I can answer that we have very good relations with all our neighbors, excluding, of course, Armenia. 
We have very good relations with Central Asian countries, with Ukraine, with Russia, Moldova, and other former Soviet republics. Nearly we uh, shared the same history for nearly two centuries, and we had very close ties with these countries, and we still are continuing our relations with these uh, countries. And uh, we have no problems with our neighbors, as I said, uh, excluding Armenia. We have very good relations with Central Asian countries. They are our neighbors uh, over Caspian Sea, as Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan. They are our brotherly countries because we shared, as I say, the common history. Uh, most of them are being Turkic-speaking countries, Muslim countries. Uh, regarding the relations, our relations with Russia, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, and so on, also we have uh, Russia is our uh, most important export partner. We have very stable, very uh, good relations with Russia. Uh, we are not blaming Russia for the Soviet period because it was uh, another, how to say, totalitarian regime uh, from which Russia suffered as well as other countries of the Soviet Union. We have very close uh, partnership relations with Ukraine, with Moldova, together with Ukraine, Moldova and uh, Georgia. We are the members of Guam organization. We all are members of Traseka program. We are members of Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization and so on. So can I say that uh, I can say that our relations are very good with all these countries. And uh, regarding how does history help develop the path to national development in the current state? If it's a general uh, question, uh, I'm not going to answer to this, but in regard with Azerbaijan, I would like to answer because, as I said, our historic relations, uh, ties with former Soviet republics helped us to develop relations with them. And also, uh, we have very good relations, very close relations with Iran, with Turkey, uh, taking the, into account that with these countries, we also shared the common history for centuries. Turkey, Turkey is our closest strategic partner, our best friend in all means, uh, helped us from the first day of independence uh, considerably, helped us politically in diplomatic field. Uh, we, it's one of the main uh, trade partners of Azerbaijan. Also, we have very good uh, friendship relations with Iran. Iran used our territory as a transit territory for its uh, goods to achieve Russian and European markets. We also use Iranian territory to get goods from uh, the Gulf. I, can, I, I can say that we have no problems with our uh, neighbors and in future I don't expect any problems with them. Yeah, that's that's uh, great to know that that you know the uh, work and the uh, consolidation of um, getting the neighbors yeah uh, more involved and in with the yeah social political uh, stability uh, uh, with you know in ensuring uh, future development. Okay, um, Excellency, we move on to a few more questions. All right. Okay, um, earlier there was a question about um, volunteerism, but this question asks, how do I participate in youth exchange programs in Azerbaijan? Uh, could you let me know if there are any? So in terms of youth exchange, uh, I think this is very specific, uh, Excellency, this question. Uh, as I said, please contact me directly, contact the embassy. I'll do my best and I'm sure that you will uh, be able to create such uh, contacts with your Azerbaijani counterparts. Of course, we have uh, a lot of youth organizations, uh, voluntary organizations in Azerbaijan and they will be great, uh, I'd say, 
they will be very grateful to us if we can uh, establish such relations between our use uh, from Azerbaijan and Malaysia. Please contact us, uh, contact embassy, and I will help you in this regard. Thank you. Very much, um, you know, Excellency. So that's always the interest, I think, the youth in Malaysia and specifically the youth in UITM and many other institutions uh, or universities uh, will be glad and very thankful for that. So next question says, in line with global development, how does Azerbaijan catch up with other countries across the globe? So uh, specifically, maybe you can share also about the economic reform programs. Uh, perhaps you have mentioned a few, but uh, they would like to know also uh, how does the economic uh, reform programs look like? Yeah. You know, I think that our, in our world, in our modern uh, age of globalization, the challenges, uh, be them positive or negative, are the same for uh, every country. And Azerbaijan also uh, tries to address all these challenges to overcome problems and to take advantage of uh, positive challenges in the world. We have a uh, very good, uh, how to say, relations with other countries ac uh, across the globe. We have uh, trade relations with more than 130 countries. We have political relations with nearly all countries, diplomatic relations and so on. And the problems are the same for us. Uh, and the uh, positive challenges also are the same for us, and we try to overcome them and to uh, take advantage of them. Uh, uh, regarding the economic reforms, as I said, uh, we uh, got very considerable revenues from oil and gas export, and we decided to, 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 to uh, use those, uh, these uh, revenues for the development of non-oil sectors of Azerbaijan to uh, assure our uh, food security, to assure our economic security, and so on. Many, many state programs on the development of uh, regions of Azerbaijan, on the development of non-oil sector in Azerbaijan, in the development of education in Azerbaijan, and so, so on. Many such programs uh, have been developed in Azerbaijan, and uh, we now see their results. Uh, as I mentioned in our in my speech, uh, recent years we have a stable uh, rise of export potential uh, non -oil, of non-oil sector of Azerbaijan economy. Uh, the last year in 2021, uh, Azerbaijan uh, the, the um, how to say, increase of national uh, domestic product in Azerbaijan was more than 5%. It's very good result in the situation of pandemic and uh, taking into account that Azerbaijan uh, was in the situation of war only one year ago. And the uh, development of non-oil sector is above 7%. Uh, and development of on oil, uh, non-oil, uh, export in Azerbaijan was about 40% last year. I think, and uh, everybody can be agree with me, that this is very good indicators of the economic development of Azerbaijan and of the success of state programs uh, implemented in Azerbaijan. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. I think um, we, we learn a lot more then. All right. Uh, next question, please. So is, is if there any is there any bilateral diplomatic between Azerbaijan and Malaysia? Someone asked this question, and I'm, I'm right. Uh, Maybe one or two last question here. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I can entirely understood uh, understand yeah. the question. If uh, we speak about bilateral diplomatic relations, of course. I am here as an ambassador of Azerbaijan, and the uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor said, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor said, uh, we established our diplomatic relations in 1993, and we established, uh, opened our embassy here in Malaysia in 2007, and also Malaysian embassy is operating in Azerbaijan. We have very good uh, political relations with uh, Malaysia in the sphere of political relations, as I said. We, Malaysia supported all our initiatives from 1991. 
within all international organizations. And uh, I have not, uh, I cannot give any example of when uh, Malaysia didn't support Azerbaijan in uh, international organizations. This is very valuable support, and we highly appreciate such a support from the side of our, uh, Malaysia. And we also support Malaysia within international organizations. And uh, Malaysia and Azerbaijani diplomatic relations can be an example how countries, how states uh, must cooperate in international arena. And I think that uh, due to these relations, we have very good potential, as I said, to develop our relations in other fields, such as economy, trade, investment, education, and so on. And I am sure that we will achieve our such goals. All right, great. Thank you, Excellency, for answering that question. And this is our final question. All right, of course, there are more questions, but we will call this as our final question. So this question is asking about the conflict in Pakistan and, and Ukraine. Does that, you know, to what extent does the conflict in Pakistan and Ukraine affect the political climate in Azerbaijan? Of course, we share the same region and every uh, positive or negative events in our neighboring countries can influence our uh, country as well. But the political climate in Azerbaijan is very stable. And I don't think that some events in other countries can affect, can affect Azerbaijani political uh, environment desirably, uh, considerably. Uh, I hope that the conflicts in uh, regard, I, I don't know what they mean, uh, clashes in Kazakhstan and the Ukrainian-Russian relations and so on. Of course, we, we value our relations with all these countries. As I said, uh, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, uh, together with Russia, are very important partners for us, and we, uh, we, we, we wish peace and security for all of them, for all of them. They are our partner countries, our friendly countries, and we wish all the best for these countries. But I don't think that any other, uh, how to say, uh, conflicts in other regions can influence Azerbaijani political climate. Thank you very much. Uh, so with that last question, um, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I wish we had more time, but I think uh, with that last question, uh, we should be able to uh, once again um, come to the end of our eighth ambassadorial lecture. Uh, of course, as usual, if the questions we may share with the embassy later, if, you know, uh, through Dr. Rafik, uh, to actually uh, perhaps, you know, share the answers later. Uh, so, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me just, uh, we've come now to towards the end of our program. I will take the opportunity to uh, very quickly uh, to thank uh, His Excellency um, Irfan Dawudov, uh, the Ambassador of the Republic of Azerbaijan to Malaysia for the very insightful um, a uh, great lecture. I think for most of us, the audience today, uh, very happy indeed, because I can tell from the number of questions, uh, Excellency, um, you know, and, and what type of questions. So uh, for your information, we're glad there were about 125 uh, participants that were on board with us. And um, they came from, of course, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Azerbaijan also, Uzbekistan, the Philippines, and Japan, China, and also Saudi Arabia. And um, so uh, last but not least, the last count was about 127. So we're happy we are starting it right this year, 2022. And uh, we are once again uh, very indebted uh, to uh, His Excellency today. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you very much. Um, Excellency, for the uh, time and the um, content and the sharing of, of what Azerbaijan is today. And that has actually created more interest 
to students and faculty members for the universities, and I'm sure for agencies that have joined us uh, today. Uh, so with that, once again, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that uh, this is definitely not the first. We look forward to many more uh, experts uh, sharing uh, on Azerbaijan in, in, in specific content and, and, and so forth. So uh, as a usual, so the very final um, gesture is to have everyone come out of their videos so we can have a group photo. All right, so let us invite all of our participants uh, to join us uh, with this final group photo. Uh, it's going to take um, a few minutes because we have many pages and we need to keep smiling, <laughs> Excellency, for for the photos, okay? Uh, so, Dr. Linda, are we ready? So, our audience, please do not be shy. Turn on your cameras so we can capture this together. All right, let us know, our uh, camera woman. <laughs> Okay, stand by, just keep smiling. All right. Okay, moving on to the next page. All right. So we still keep smiling, right? Yes. <laughs> Just stay smiling. All right. Okay, last one. So any freestyle, Dr. Linda? The uh, Malaysians? Yeah, sure. Let's do some freestyle. Okay, we're done. All right, so um, of course, our virtual clap to His Excellency. Uh, thank you very much once again. We look forward uh, to uh, future collaborations with the Embassy of Azerbaijan in Malaysia. So with that, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of our eighth ambassadorial lecture. Uh, so thank you once again. Salam alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Uh, we hope to see everyone in our next uh, ambassadorial lecture. Uh, we'll update everyone. Bye bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this event. You're welcome. And the best regards from uh, Prof. Sazili also to you, uh, you. Excellency. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.